Welcome to Biostatistics for Biomedical Research, Session 6. If you're watching this video um, during the YouTube premiere, you'll be able to ask questions in the chat box. Uh, set the chat box for live so that the uh, most recent questions and answers will appear at the top. Uh, those of you watching this after the YouTube premiere can ask questions on the dedicated topic for this session on datamethods.org. So today's session is primarily about parametric two-sample tests. So these are tests used for comparing two groups on a continuous variable such as blood pressure. The course notes uh, were last updated on December the 4th, 2019 that we're using in today's video. And uh, we're dealing now with section 5.9 the two sample test for means uh, parametric test and so the setup is we have two groups of different subjects so these are subjects that are not overlapping uh, so it's for unpaired data this is the more common sort of statistical test than the one sample test that we talked about in the last session um, and so uh, we're now assuming uh, for the moment that the raw data arise from a Gaussian or normal distribution. As we see with the Bayesian t-test, we can relax that assumption uh, rather easily. And we're assuming for the moment that the two groups have the same variability or variance or standard deviation. And this is something that can be fairly easily relaxed for both uh, frequentist traditional t-test as well as the Bayesian t-test. Although in the traditional t-test, the methods for handling the unequal variance case are only approximate. So let's uh, get into um, the frequentist t-test. So we're testing whether the unknown population mean for group 1 is the same as the unknown population mean for group 2. For example, uh, population 1 might be all the patients who qualify with a certain disease at baseline uh, that are given a new drug in a population two is those given a standard drug. So the formal null hypothesis is that mu1 is equal to mu2, um, which means mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. And you can easily generalize that to test whether the difference is some specific value uh, although this is not used very often because in the frequentist paradigm, zero is sort of a special value. Uh, so the difference in the unknown means is our QOI or quantity of interest. And so we're going to concentrate on that quantity um, in, in today's session. So let's suppose that we have two samples from the two the populations and the population one sample is size N1 and uh, we have N2 observations from the second population. The form of the two sample parametric t-test that assumes normality and equal variances uh, is this t-ratio that you see here. And the form of a t-ratio is um, that we have a point estimate of the quantity of interest and then we divide that by the standard error of the numerator. So the, the QOI point estimate is the difference in the observed sample means for group 1 and group 2. So the way that we look at the t-ratio is we judge the numerator with respect to the denominator. So the denominator tells us how much information base uh, the numerator has, which is a function of the sample size and the subject-to-subject -subject variability. The more subject-to-subject -subject variability you have, that's essentially like taking away from the sample size. So the denominator is a way to normalize the numerator to get a unitless uh, ratio. And the no denominator is very similar to a uh, signal-to-noise ratio. Now when you're getting the variance of a difference of two independent means, uh, which is the same as the variance of a sum of two independent means, that is the sum of the variance of the individual means. And so if we have a common raw data variance, which is sigma squared, and we have sample sizes N1 and N2, the variance of X bar 1 is this, and the variance of X bar 2 is this. And so the variance of the difference of the two means is, is simply uh, 
this. And so we know the sample sizes, and we're going to assume the sample sizes are not random variables. We're going to assume they were fixed in advance, so they're just constants. Uh, but we need to estimate sigma squared from the two samples. And so if we assume that the two sigma squares are estimating the same quantity, uh, we just can get a pooled estimate of this common sigma squared, and we'll call it S squared. And so we take the two sample variances, S1 squared and S2 squared, we weight them by their degrees of freedom, um, and so what the numerator is is just a grand total of sums of squares deviations about uh, each person's own group mean divided by the total degrees of freedom. Uh, and the minus one there is because to get an unbiased estimate of the variance, we have to estimate the mean first. Uh, so taking uh, this sum and dividing by the total degrees of freedom gives us our estimate of the the uh, overall sigma squared, this is called the pooled uh, variance estimate. Now the true standard error of the difference in two means is given by this equation, and we're going to give a plug-in estimate for sigma of s, and so our estimate of the standard deviation of the difference in two means, which we call the standard error of the difference in two means, is, is just this, so now our t-ratio becomes this quantity here. So we have the difference, which is our quantity of interest on the observed sample, divided by this amount of information and variability that we have, uh, which is the standard error or precision of the difference. And now that's our t statistic. If the null hypothesis that the two groups have the same mean is true, then this t ratio has a t distribution with n1 plus n2 minus 2 degrees of freedom. And then in order to get a two-tailed p-value, we just need to compute the tail areas uh, from the t distribution uh, to find out what's the chance of getting a result as or more extreme than the one observed in absolute value. Absolute values go along with it being a two-tailed test, so this is a non-directional test that's just looking for evidence for a difference in any direction. So suppose that we had eight subjects in group one and 21 subjects in group two, and we observed these two standard deviations, which we're assuming are just within sampling error of uh, estimating the same quantity, and we observe these two means so now we get our weighted average of the two uh, variances. That gives us our pooled estimate of variance. Um, and then uh, we take the square root of that to get the standard error of the difference in two means. And now, uh, I mean, to get the standard deviation of the raw data estimate. And then we multiply by the square root of the sum of the reciprocals of the sample size to get the standard error for the difference of two means. So our T ratio is 5.42, which is the difference of these two, divided by that standard error, or, or 0.74. Now that's not much evidence for a difference, and that has 27 degrees of freedom. So the p-value for that, the chance of getting a T ratio as large or larger than that in absolute value, if the true uh, model is holding of normality equal variance, and uh, equal means in the two groups, the probability of that is 0.463, which is the two-tailed uh, p-value. So we have little evidence for concluding that the population means are different, or little evidence for rejecting the assumption that they are the same, is a slightly more accurate way to say it. So this is just showing some R code for doing the computations, including the p-value which is using the absolute value of the observed t-statistic and getting the tail area in one tail and just doubling that to get the two-sided p-value. Uh, now instead of formal hypothesis testing, we can calculate a confidence interval. And the formula for the confidence interval in this uh, equal variance case is very simple. So you just take the observed difference plus or minus the critical value from the t-distribution with this degrees of freedom and the 1 minus alpha over 2 level. So if alpha is 0.05, this will be the 0.975 quantile of the t-distribution. 
times the standard error time, a standard deviation times what turns it into the standard error. Uh, that is a one minus alpha confidence limit for the unknown difference uh, in means. So it's a very simple formula. It's making a lot of simplifying assumptions. So that is the uh, parametric frequentist traditional two sample t-test in a nutshell. You can see the computations are very very easy uh, which was appealing especially before we had all the computing power that we have now. So let's turn to the Bayesian t-test which has st starts with the same sort of parametric assumptions uh, but we can quickly relax some of the assumptions. So as we did with the one sample Bayesian t-test for paired data we can use a t-distribution not only thinking about it for a test statistic but using it for the raw data. So the t-distribution as you'll recall the smaller the degrees of freedom the heavier the tails and so if you allow the degrees of freedom to be much smaller than say 20 uh, you can have a very heavy tailed uh, distribution and the effect of that is if you have heavy tailed um, distribution and at the this gives you a more robust analysis. It does not allow the observations way out in the tails to carry the same amount of weight that they would have if you assumed you had a normal distribution which has very thin uh, light tails. So as uh, discussed in a previous session, uh, most of our Bayesian analyses are going to be put into a general regression modeling framework so that you just have one sort of method to learn in terms of syntax and our model that we have for the two group comparison where there's no covariates to adjust for uh, can be written this way so the outcome variable, the response variable y is, is arising from some unknown mean in the reference group we're going to call, call mu zero now the mean in a reference group such as placebo patients. Um, and then we're going to have an offset. How do you get from the reference group to the second group? So let's say the reference group is group A and, and the, uh, the other group is group B. So delta is what moves you from group A to group B. So that is the regression coefficient for the treatment variable. If the treatment variable is coded as one, for group B, so this is just the notation for an indicator variable. If group B is true, you give a 1. If you're in group A, you get a 0. And then we have our irreducible error, which is the subject-to-subject -subject variability that we cannot explain with other information. So we're assuming there's no covariates that could make uh, epsilon smaller than what we, what we get here. Um, and now this tells us our complete model except for what is the assumption, what are the assumptions about epsilon. So we're assuming uh, for the moment that the variance of epsilon is the same for every, every observation. That will be easy to relax. And we're assuming that epsilon has a certain distribution. So if we allow epsilon to have a T distribution with unknown degrees of freedom, we're allowing for an arbitrary amount of non-normality. Uh, now we are assuming symmetry uh, around the overall mean, mode, and median of the distribution and that is definitely an assumption and that assumption could be relaxed by using an asymmetric distribution for epsilon that has not only a parameter for how heavy the tails are but another parameter for how asymmetric the distribution is. So let's assume that epsilon has a t-distribution with new degrees of freedom as we did with the one sample t-test with Bayes and we'll put a prior distribution on new that allows the data distribution to be all the way from normal to heavy tailed. Uh, normally we don't know a whole lot about the raw unknown mean for the reference group. Uh, we might know that from the study enrollment criterion and for general knowledge but we typically put a pretty wide prior distribution on the reference group's mean and then we put a prior distribution on the difference in means between group A and group B uh, 
uh, that might be informed by prior reliable research or biological knowledge, or we might have a prior that rules out impossible values, such as a drug that lowers blood pressure by more than 30 millimeters of mercury, or we might just use a general skeptical prior, which is what is recommended more often than not. Now we're going to relax the equal variance assumption and we're going to have um, a different sigma squared uh, for group A and group B and uh, we don't really know uh, how different it is but the way we're going to model that is we're going to model it through the ratio of variances of the two groups and we're going to pr put a prior distribution on the log of the variance so when the variance ratio is 1 um, that means the variances are the same and so the prior distribution is going to be tilted towards one uh, but it's going to allow the variances to be the variance ratio to be much different from one but we're not going to allow the variance ratio to be like 0 0.01 or 100 uh, we're going to put some uh, limitation on it with a probability distribution for the log variance ratio so we are specifying uh, independent priors for these different quantities, mu zero, delta, and for the variance ratio. And concerning just uh, mu zero and delta, uh, by putting a prior on delta that is statistically independent of the prior for mu zero, we're going to assume that the state of knowledge about these two is really uncorrelated. And if you were to rephrase the priors, uh, from this assumption to have a prior for mu0 and a prior for mu1 you would see that the priors for mu0 and mu1 are correlated so by having a prior for delta we're putting some restriction on how different the means are uh, which would in the other uh, uh, par parameterization would have a correlation of two priors so we're assuming that we know more about delta than we do about the individual raw means. And now how do we specify uh, the standard deviation for the prior for a log variance ratio? If we're going to assume the prior is symmetric in the log variance ratio scale. So let's let little r be the ratio of the unknown variances. And let's assume that the variance ratio being greater than 1.5 or less than the opposite of that is, is something that is very unlikely. And gamma is going to be the amount of uh, likelihood of that being true. So if you set gamma and you solve for what standard deviation of the normal distribution would make this happen, uh, you would see that uh, the standard deviation is equal to the log of 1.5 divided by the negative of the normal distribution quantile at gamma. And so this R code just shows how you would calculate that. And so if we said ahead of time that the probability of having a variance ratio greater than 1.5, um, which is the probability of it being less than 1 over 1.5, is equal to only 0.15, then the standard deviation of the normal distribution for the log variance ratio scale has to be 0.391, which is what we're going to use in our Bayesian uh, t-test. So we're giving higher chance for the variance ratio to be uh, one or equal variances, but we're allowing it to be a, f a fair amount different from one. Now before getting into um, a longer example where we actually go through the Bayesian and Frequentist analysis, uh, let's take a, a side trip and talk about power and sample size. We often use uh, traditional Frequentist methods for doing sample size calculations because it's very handy and you can do all this with fully uh, purely Bayes methods that don't really have as many unobservables as what we do in the frequentist analysis. But let's use the simplified approach and let's suppose that um, capital delta is our quantity of interest and let's suppose we're interested in uh, an, uh, uh, bi-directional analysis so the, the treatment effect is going to get larger when the absolute difference in means gets larger.
the power that makes the power go up. So your ability to detect a difference of delta, an unknown difference is going to go up. The bigger delta is, the more obvious the effect is. The power also goes up as the sample size in the two groups go up. And the power goes up if N1 and N2 are close to each other. So when you have balance in the allocation of treatments, um, you'll have more power. Power also goes up when the subject-to-subject -subject variability goes down or when you relax the, um, the assertion probability alpha. So power depends on all these quantities approximately through the formula that you see here. Now this um, is approximate because we're really not taking into account uncertainty in estimating sigma and um, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. So when you're using a power calculator, it might be an online program such as the one linked to here or uh, the Department of, Vanderbilt, Department of Biostatistics at Vanderbilt PS program for power and sample size. Um, you may be asked to give the, the difference that you want to detect uh, or you might be asked to state the two means and you can just give one of the means a zero and the other one is the difference and get the same calculation. Um, so we really need to account for having to estimate sigma uh, and also we need to account for the fact that if we have an estimate of sigma from pilot data it is only an estimate and you might want to do something like use the upper confidence interval for sigma from the pilot data and when you're plugging it into the frequency calculations for power because we often underestimate the true standard deviation of the raw data. So we're going to really ignore that point, but it's something to think about for the future. So there is a package in R called PWR, which will give you uh, the t-test parametric power calculations. So if we assumed a pooled estimate of sigma uh, using the value s above, which is 17.5, and we wanted to detect a difference of five in either direction using a two-tailed test. We had a hundred subjects in each of two groups and a, a type 1 error 0 0.05, which means that we're going to accept a, a one out of 20 call of a positive uh, when there's no difference, no matter how big the sample size is, which is quite suspicious. Um, this is how we do the calculation. So the power uh, from the two sample t-test we give the sample sizes the delta to detect and that delta is going to be in standard uh, deviation units or so-called z-score or Cohen's d uh, we give the alpha and when you uh, run that function you, you get the calculation that the standardized difference we're trying to detect is 0.285 that's in the standard deviation units and um, the power uh, to detect a difference of 5 is only uh, 0.51. The power is that low because the effect that we're trying to detect is not that large in terms of subject to subject uh, standard deviation. So the sample size will depend on the uh, ratio of the two sample sizes. Uh, the delta, the power, and the alpha, the sample size goes down as the effect size goes up that you want to be able to detect. Uh, this is often used for gaming uh, sample size calculations. Uh, sample size goes down as the ratio of the individual sample sizes goes to 1, as the standard deviation goes down as alpha goes up or the required power goes down. So it's very common to use a required power of 0.8, which means a type 2 error of 0.2, which is quite odd that you're willing to uh, have a type 2 error that's four times larger than the type 1 error. Um, I like to use a power of 0.9 as a minimum in most cases. Uh, so here's an approximate formula that really ignores the uncertainty of estimating sigma squared. Um, so it's using a z instead of a t uh, statistic. Uh, when the power is 0.9 and alpha is 0.05, uh, this gives you, uh, if k is the ratio of sample sizes, this gives you the two sample sizes you would need uh, 
uh, to achieve uh, those operating characteristics. If you want to do exact calculations, assuming normality of the raw data and assuming equal variance, you can use power.ttest in, in the PWR package in R, and you can see that um, if we had uh, 194 subjects in each of two groups, uh, we would get a, power, a, a fairly low power of 0.8. If you did a two-to-one randomization with the same total sample size, uh, you would see that you need 129 in one group and 259 in the other with that ratio. Uh, but the power then is going to be reduced from 0.8 down to 0.75. That's not as an efficient uh, of a design. Now, this is a kind of an odd way of looking at it, uh, but what is the observed difference in means that you would need to achieve to give a two-sided p-value of exactly a magical, uh, crazy 0.05 if you have normality and equal variances and the sample sizes are equal and they're both equal to little n over 2. So you can solve for delta hat in the t formula uh, that would make uh, your, your observed t ratio equal to the critical value for the t distribution and here's what happens. So if you have sample size of 10, 50, or 100 corresponding to these results here, the magic values of the observed difference that you would have to get to get a p-value of exactly 0.05, they're going to go down as the sample size goes up. And um, so you would need to observe a difference of 1.46 uh, with only 10 observations um, and you would need to observe a difference of 0.56 with 50 observations and 0.4 with 100 observations. Now that was worded as if the observed standard deviation were 1, but the way you think about this in general is you would need to have these multiples of the observed standard deviation uh, to have a p-value of 0.05. So those are thresholds that are independent of the power and the effect size used in the calculation. And of course they're, they're assuming the 0.05 level is somehow magical and we know that's simply not the case. Uh, what is a better way to look at this, and often it's better than calculating power, is to ask how big does the sample size need to be before we have a certain margin of error in estimating the unknown difference in means. And so um, we would like to nail down our estimate of the difference in means to within a margin of error plus or minus delta with a 1 minus alpha confidence level when the two sample sizes are equal. So this is an approximate formula for giving you the sample size required to have a confidence interval that will be uh, plus or minus delta off of the observed difference. And, um, sorry, that should be plus or minus delta over 2 off the observed difference. So, uh, delta is half the width of the confidence interval. So, at the 0.05 level, um, the number of observations needed to achieve uh, this margin of error is 7.68 times the square of the ratio of the true standard deviation to the margin of error that you're willing to accept. Now you can also equate a margin of error to a detectable difference. In the simple case of um, a parametric t-test, there is a simple one-to-one -one relationship between the two. And the um, margin of error delta is equal to the uh, a difference the true difference that you would like to be able to detect times a constant. And so the margin of error turns out to be 0.6 times the um, effect size that you will be able to detect. Now what about assumptions of the two sample t-test? Well there's a way to look at all the assumptions together other than the assumption of independence of observations and the way you can do that is calculate the cumulative distribution function uh, 
the empirical non-parametric estimator, which is called the ECDF, and you transform that for each of the samples using the inverse normal transformation, and then you plot those curves and see if they're linear, which would mean normality. These are like QQ plots. And then see if they're parallel, which is checking the equal variance assumption. Um, without showing the assumptions in as much detail, you can get a rough idea of this by making stratified box plots. And you can look for equal spread uh, in the two groups. That is not really a good way to look at normality. Of course, you can informally compare the two standard deviations. Now, with the Bayesian t-test, the only important assumption to check is the symmetry of the data distribution, because we're allowing the data distribution to be non-normal. So let's get into a comprehensive example. So this was a randomized study, and you can click the link here to uh, go to the original uh, description. Um, the study was intended to assess the effect of caffeine versus placebo on muscle metabolism uh, measured by the ratio of the carbon dioxide produced to the oxygen consumed. And that's the respiratory exchange ratio, or RER. So the treatment was assigned to 18 subjects, um, nine subjects in each group, and it's a parallel group randomized controlled trial. So the goal is to study the effect of caffeine on the RER, this ratio. Now, um, the original analysis analyzed the ratio as it stood, and that's not really recommended because ratios are asymmetric measures. And so going up by a factor of two versus going down by a factor of two, those don't cancel out on the ratio scale, but on the log scale, they cancel out. So you really should almost always use logs when analyzing ratios, and that gives us a completely symmetric measure. So on the um, log scale is what we model, and so mu0 is going to be the mean log ratio for placebo, mu1 is going to be the mean log ratio for caffeine, and then our full change effect is going to be the analog of that difference. The null hypothesis is H0 mu0 equals mu1, which is the same as the null hypothesis that the full change effect is equal to 1. The alternative hypothesis is that there is some difference on either direction. Now there's a side note here that you need to be critical when uh, analyzing ratios like RER. Uh, they often have some statistical problems and often make some assumptions that are not warranted. Um, for example, if the way you're normalizing for the O2 consumption uh, really isn't linear, it, then you shouldn't have a simple denominator of O2 uh, in, in the ratio. So the, the way that you analyze the carbon dioxide output might need to be adjusted for O2 in a more complicated way than this ratio assumes. So let's um, suppose we were looking at this prospectively and we were, for this situation, doing a sample size calculation and then we had a pilot study that estimated sigma as 0.1. So to be honest about it, it, it the, the sample standard deviation uh, would really need to be less than 0.1 for us to assume a 0.1 for the true value. Uh, so the effect size delta is on the log RER scale, which you analog, analog to get the full change. Determine the number of subjects for several values of the effect size that you want to detect in order to have 0.9 power with uh, 0.05 alpha. So this just goes through uh, full changes of 1.1, 1.15, 1.2, 1.25, 1.5. Calculates the log of the full change. Uh, and then puts that in standard deviation units using this value of 0.1 and then finding the uh, sample size and then rounding that up to the nearest whole number. So you can see for these different fold changes, this is the log of that, uh, so that's on the scale that we're analyzing. And for a fold change of 1.1, which is fairly uh, modest, would require 25 subjects per group, but to detect a full change of 1.5, uh, 
which is a huge effect in, in view of the standard deviation on the log uh, full chain scale being only 0.1, you could get away with only three subjects in each group. So let's, let's go with uh, effect size of 1.15 uh, where you could enroll 12 subjects to get uh, power of 0.9 and then let's do the important calculation of what sort of margin of error would this study yield. Um, and so that is calculated below. The details of that were in an earlier section. And then you get the margin of error on the log scale and anti-log it to get the full change margin of error, which is really a multiplicative margin of error. So here's the calculation, and we see that um, the multiplicative margin of error with a 12 subjects in each group study would be uh, a factor of 1.08, which is not too bad. Now the data that were collected are shown here. The first nine subjects are placebo. Then you have those randomized to caffeine. You have the RER, uh, this ratio primary analysis variable. You have the log of that, the scale we're analyzing it. And then we see a uh, plot of the data. So we have the raw data and then we have these red diamonds are showing the median of each group. So we see a shift to the left of the data in the caffeine group. They're tending to have smaller RER. So we're going to look at the comprehensive assessment of the two sample t-test assumptions in the, the usual two sample t-test, uh, especially if you're uh, using uh, equality of variance is your assumption. And so when we run this uh, empirical cumulative distribution function for log RER, group it by treatment, and then transform it by the inverse normal or Z transformation, we get figure 5.9, which is this. So for the two sample ordinary t-test to be holding, you want these two to be straight and you want them to be parallel. And with the sample sizes we have, which was only nine in each group, you can see that our ability to really make a conclusion from that is, is fairly limited. So it's probably best not to rely on the data to tell us uh, where the data really come from. So now we're going to use the parametric frequentist two sample t-test. And in R, the default is, thank goodness, to not assume equal variance. So we're going to analyze the log of this ratio uh, modeled as a function of treatment. And we're using, uh, this, this actually uses caffeine as the reference group. We really wanted placebo to be the reference group, but that's the way this t-test function works. So you see the t-statistic is for testing a full change of 1.0 uh, is 2.06. And the confidence interval for the log of the full change, which is the difference of the logs of the means, is minus 0.002 to 0.13 if you're treating caffeine as the reference group. These are the two um, raw sample means on the log scale. So subjects given caffeine have, on average, a log RER that is 0.064 lower, uh, and the confidence interval just to negate the one that was above because we want placebo to be the reference group minus 0.13 to 0.002. And so if you want to get it on the full chain scale, which we do, you analog those three numbers and you see the median full change is 0.94. This isn't really the mean full change, but it's the median as the footnote explains. And the 95% confidence interval for the full change is 0 0.878 to 1.002. So that's how we summarize results when we've logged the data uh, because we started with a ratio. So now we're going to turn to the Bayesian two sample t test. And as we did with the one sample t test, we're going to use a similar notation using the RBRMS package, which makes it easy to do these general linear models and we're putting our two sample t-test in the general linear model framework. Now, one thing that's really remarkable about the BRMS package is how you can make the variation, uh, which is modeled as the log of the unknown standard deviation of the raw data, 
that can depend on a model. And that model doesn't have to be just allowing the variances to differ by uh, treatment as we're going to do, but you might have covariates in the model and the log of the standard deviation might depend on the covariates. And so, first of all, we're going to set priors. So for the intercept, which is the mean um, the, of the log RER for placebo, we're going to set a prior that's just the empty prior, which means nothing, which means just a flat, non-informative prior. And then for the difference in the log ratios, we're going to use a normal uh, centered at zero with a standard deviation of 0.25, and that is for the coefficient in the model, which is the caffeine level of the treatment variable. And now for the log SD ratio, we're going to assume normal with mean zero and standard deviation 0.39, which we derived earlier. So that's how we set that prior. And we're going to use defaults uh, otherwise. Uh, the, def the default for new is gamma with parameters 2 and 0.1. Statisticians are not used to thinking of in such generality, but you can see with the BRM function and the BRMS package, it has this wrapper function BF, which is for connecting multiple formulas. So we have our first formula is our formula for the mean on the log scale, and our second formula is for the uh, log of the standard deviation. So this looks like standard deviation, but it's actually modeling the log. Uh, to give it the right property. So we have we have a model for the location, a model for the spread, two separate models that can be fairly different. Uh, family equals student means we're going to use a t-distribution for the raw data and we're going to connect all the priors together into one prior object. So there's five parameters for this model. Uh, there's two parameters that correspond to the two means. Um, there is um, uh, two parameters for the log standard deviation and there's one parameter for the degrees of freedom of the raw data distribution for T. Um, and if you run prior summary uh, you see what is assumed about all the priors and Nathan James has written up this description uh, to help you interpret the output of prior summary which is, which is here. Um, so now we're going to print the model summary after we've run the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, these took about a minute uh, to run. And so here's our uh, first formula. Log RER is modeled as a function of treatment and our second formula is sigma, which is really log sigma, is modeled as treatment also to allow for two variances. Um, and then we're going to get 4,000 posterior draws in all and here are our estimates as posterior means and we get the 0.95 credible intervals for each of these parameters. Um, we get some convergence uh, diagnostics. This r hat value of 1 is very good. That's perfect. Um, then we get the credible interval for nu, the degrees of freedom. Um, and so the credible interval goes all the way from an extremely heavy tail distribution to uh, something that could be not distinguished from a normal distribution, 53 degrees of freedom. And so the small sample size is why this is so incredibly wide. We really can't tell from these data anything definitive about the data being normally distributed. So we're going to plot a kernel density estimate uh, for posterior parameters and some uh, diagnostics, and that's in the next graph. So you see the posterior distribution for the uh, mean of the log in the placebo group, log RER. Uh, this is the posterior distribution for the log of the standard deviation for the uh, placebo group. This is the posterior distribution for the treatment effect on the, uh, this log scale for means. And so we see it's moved away from zero, which would be no treatment effect. The caffeine uh, observed a lower uh, RER ratio than placebo. And now our evidence for the uh, equality of variances, 
This is kind of centered at zero, which means uh, it's not unreasonable that the variances might be equal, but it's so incredibly wide that we really don't know. And when you get the, the distributions up here, like this one, uh, this distribution is going to be a little wider for not having known that the variances were equal uh, and for not having known that the data are normally distributed. And this is our evidence about the degree to which the data are normally distributed. And we see uh, some extremely uh, heavy tails likely, uh, although it's also um, possible for it to be very normally distributed. I'm not going to go into these outputs right now because I haven't had time to study their interpretation. But we're going to reformat the output of the Bayesian model to make it easier to manipulate uh, the quantities, uh, which are our posterior draws, our, our random samples from the posterior distribution. Remember the philosophy of modern Bayes, when you don't have a simple conjugate prior distribution like the beta distribution with a proportion, is we don't know how to derive the posterior and we don't need it. We just sample from the posterior distribution enough thousands of times and that's like knowing the whole posterior distribution. If you really wanted to know it, you would sample 40,000 times instead of the 4,000 that we took time to do. So we're going to pull off these posterior values, samples, from these different parameters, the mean for placebo group on the log scale, the delta, which is our treatment effect on the log scale, the standard deviation of the placebo, which is the analog of the uh, uh, posterior sample for the log standard deviations. And then the standard deviation ratio is just going to be the analog of sampling uh, from this posterior distribution for the log of the ratio. And we're going to pull off the degrees of freedom. And so we can make a histogram of the difference in the mean log RER. We can do a easily any transformation, and you don't need to know the, the statistical methods for deriving the distribution of transform parameters. It's just a rephrasing of the individual posterior draws. So we're going to apply the analog uh, to every posterior sample of the treatment effect to get the fold change, and then we're going to get a density plot of that, this is really using a non-parametric density estimator. Um, and so um, we're going to draw a reference line at a ratio of 1. We're going to get a posterior density of the ratio of standard deviations. Um, and then we're going to calculate our posterior probabilities. Remember, we did this trick in the one sample test. And p is just a rephrasing of the mean function. So when you say mean of something, this variable, how often is it? Is this true? How often is delta less than zero? And so the RER is less for caffeine uh, subjects. And so by calculating the mean of something that's true or false, or as an indicator variable, you're just calculating the proportion of times it was true. And that's just estimating the posterior probability. So we have this sort of nice notation. So the posterior probability that the uh, caffeine uh, subjects are shifted to the left in terms of RER is 0.965. That's the same exact thing as the probability that the full change is less than 1. But you can also do so much more with the posterior probabilities. Let's suppose, um, I'm just making this up, uh, that the physiologically noticeable response would be a full change of 0.95 or less. So what's the probability that the true unknown full change that's due to caffeine is less than 0.95 and that is 0.57. So we we're, we're have a, a fair amount of certainty that caffeine shifts by some non-zero amount to the left. So caffeine has an effect. We're very uncertain about whether caffeine has a physiologically noticeable effect. Uh, now we can also say, uh, we can do similarity analysis. This really is very hard to do with the frequentist idea. So what's the probability that the full change is between 0.975 and 1 over 
So that's 0.141. So we have, interestingly, uh, a fairly low probability of similarity of the response for the two treatment groups, even with this uh, small sample size. What's the probability that the raw data come from approximately normal distributions? So we're taking that to mean degrees of freedom greater than 20, and that probability is fairly low. So we don't have good evidence of normality, but the method that we're using doesn't really rely on that one way or another. It takes that uncertainty fully into account. Whereas most frequentist analyses, we we do an assessment of equal variance and make a go or no-go decision, and we don't factor in the uncertainties uh, in that decision. So this is the histogram of the treatment effect on the log scale. This is the density estimate of the posterior distribution for the full change, the treatment effect. So this would be a ratio of, of RERs, which is a ratio of ratios. And now we have the uh, density function for the ratio of raw data standard deviations. What evidence do we have for equality of variability? Um, and you can see the posterior distribution is fairly wide there. But it is possible that the standard deviations are very similar. Now, we had in the original frequentist analysis a two-tailed p-value of 0.057. Now, the first issue with that is it's very hard to know whether you should be doing a two-tailed or one-tailed test. Um, and you can say that the two-tailed test is really having a multiplicity adjustment to control the fact that you might have written a paper for an elevation of RER with uh, caffeine just as likely as you might have written a paper for the reduction of RER with caffeine. And um, there are people who would say, well, you didn't show anything because the p-value is 0.057, and they make the absence of evidence as not evidence for absence error, or they just call the result insignificant, which doesn't tell us hardly anything. Or, and, and so um, this 0.057 is very easy to misuse for those who are not really savvy about the use of null hypothesis significance testing and p-values. Uh, but contrast that with a Bayesian result that shows if you use a fairly skeptical prior for the log fold change effect, treatment effect, uh, you get a posterior probability of over 0.95, and if you were a betting person, you would tend to make money by betting on caffeine having an effect, which is a lot different way to think about it than the 0.057 might have led you to believe. Now let's compare everything, um, not everything, but compare some of the quantities. These are the sample estimates. So the sample estimate of the uh, log RER has a mean of zero in the uh, uh, placebo group. That, that should not be drug one. That should say placebo. Uh, and it has a, a posterior mode of minus 0.01, a posterior mean of zero posterior median of minus 0.01. Uh, likewise for the standard deviation, and then for the treatment effect on this log ratio scale, you see very similar results no matter which summary of the Bayesian posterior distribution you use, we're getting minus 0.06. Uh, and then the ratio of the standard deviations was observed to be 0.81 our most likely value from our posterior distribution for that ratio is 0.86. The posterior mean is 1. The posterior median is 0.95. So we put a little skepticism on how far from 1 the ratio standard deviations could be, and that's reflected in these numbers here and to a little extent in this number here compared to the 0.81. Uh, what is the 0.95 credible interval for the treatment effect on the log scale? It's minus 0.12 uh, to 0.005, which you can compare to the 95% confidence interval that we had uh, from our traditional frequentist approach. Now, there is a wonderful tutorial about using BRMS for a two-sample t-test with more annotation.
that's available from this site here, so I encourage you to look at that. Let's shift gears and do a, a reprise of some of what we were talking about in an earlier session about problems with hypothesis test and p-values to make sure everyone understands some of the key issues. Uh, so one issue is should you be doing hypothesis testing at all and the earlier section mentioned that my opinion that hypothesis testing is is more appropriate for existence type of hypotheses such as does extrasensory perception exist. For assessing effects of drugs, procedures, devices that's more of an estimation problem than it is a formal hypothesis testing problem, even though we usually use null hypothesis testing. I don't think we should have been doing that. And then there's a problem with hypothesis testing is a lot of studies are powered to detect huge effects only, and that's especially true for sin single investigator studies. And what happens when you power a study that way is when the effect is not huge, you get no information at all from the study except that you knew how to spend money. Uh, now, p-values, uh, remember that they provide evidence against something, never evidence in favor of something. And a p-value is a probability of statistic as impressive or more impressive than yours if the null hypothesis is true. P-value is not the probability of an effect. No conclusion at all is possible from large p-values other than the p-value is not small. There's no subject matter conclusion you can make. You cannot conclude clinical relevance from a small p-value, and adjustment of p-values for multiple tests is actually very arbitrary, and there's no guiding statistical principles to tell us exactly which one multiplicity adjustment to use. Declaring a result as significant or non-significant is completely arbitrary, has lost all of its meaning and it relies on arbitrary cutoffs. Any cutoff that you use, whether it's 0.05 or 0.005, is going to be arbitrary and it's going to be subject to gaming. And the American Statistical Association has gone on record as saying we should banish the word significant and the word significance um, and not use bright line thresholds for declaring something significant. So um, what are some ways that you should use p-values if you're going to use them and how should you not use them. So it's probably easier to show how not to use a p-value. So this first one is the issue of statistical versus clinical significance. P-value is 0.02. We still don't know if it's clinically significant. They should put this result into practice. Uh, a p-value of 0.4 if you want to conclude as many papers have done that a drug does not kill people. Uh, that is a completely inappropriate uh, uh, conclusion for a mortality safety assessment uh, using p-values. A p-value of 0.2, but saying there's a trend in favor of our new blockbuster drug, that's not appropriate because if you look at the confidence interval, you'll see there's a trend against the drug. There's a trend making the drug look bad. Uh, a very common psychological error is to say we reject no hypothesis of no difference and the observed difference is say six millimeters of mercury blood pressure so we're going to act like the true difference is, is six instead of really thinking about the uncertainties in that difference. Uh, we do a study that was uh, really too small for an adverse event assessment and we get a, an incidence of 0.013 0.01 in the placebo group and 0.03 in a drug group so we don't make any statement and we say we just can't know anything well that's not really the case and I think Bayes would help with that um, you mis misinterpret confidence intervals so you get a reduction of six millimeters of mercury with a confidence interval of 1 to 11 you might think that the drug is just as likely to reduce by one millimeter as it is by six, and that's not really the case. Um, and then this is a this is a misinterpretation by uh, of the raw data. So you're saying you're trying to give a statistic that is telling you about the variation across the animals, but you're using the standard deviation standard error when you should be using the standard deviation or the interquartile range would be more descriptive for statements like this. 
So this is just a confusion of standard errors and standard deviations. Now how should we present results? Well, estimates should be accompanied by uncertainty intervals, or better is to show the whole posterior distribution. You should show uncertainty limits uh, without regard to sample size or power. Um, a computed value from a sample is only an estimate of the population value, whether or not you reject a null hypothesis. It's best to think of the estimate from a study as a fuzz, not as a point. To present variability of subjects, use the standard deviation or the interquartile range or some other quantile range, not the standard error. And if you really, really must use p-values, don't make a declaration of significance uh, and don't say p is less than or greater than something. Just give the p-value and let the reader decide. So one of my real pet peeves is to read a paper where the author has written that a result of a p less than 0.05 will be deemed statistically significant. Well, it's not the author's place to make that conclusion. That is the reader's job. And so this should not be preset in a manuscript or in a grant proposal. So there are some in-depth guidelines for presenting frequentist results, uh, which you can go to this link in the datamethods.org site. And there's some examples of Bayesian versus frequentist summaries uh, when you go to this site listed here. So I want to thank you for uh, being part of this session. Look forward to your comments and uh, questions on datamethods.org. Thanks.